Welcome to the Insert Philosophy Here podcast. Inserting the principles of philosophy into real life. If we are to consider ethics in the operation of business, which we certainly should, we need to consider all manner of forms of ethical theory, and that includes ancient ethical theory. And so this video is going to just quickly look at two ancient ethicists, Aristotle from ancient Greece and Master Kung, more commonly known as Confucius, from ancient China. We can consider them together not just because they are both ancient, but because they really did have similar approaches to ethics in that their ethical theories focus on virtue. That's different from more modern theories which focus either on the conceptions of duty to commands or utilitarian consequentialist considerations. Virtue ethics focuses on the cultivation of personal virtue with the idea that if one is virtuous, then one will do virtuous acts. It's like simple training. The more we train to do ethical things ethically, the easier it becomes for us to do ethical acts. For Aristotle, he ties ethics to the concept that all human beings, like all things in the universe, have a distinct purpose and goal. For human beings, Aristotle believed that our purpose and goal is to live a certain kind of life. He wrote, we state the function of man to be a certain kind of life, and this to be an activity or actions of the psyche implying a rational principle, and the function of a good man to be the good and noble performance of these. Now, this quote is from his book on morality, Nicomachean Ethics, in which he summarizes his observations of what constitutes the good. His moral theory is in line with his method of understanding objects based on observations. And he's reporting to us what he sees as the objective facts about achieving human excellence. And so his approach produces a straightforward and grounded ethical philosophy, but it is constrained by the limits of his experience. And being a man of privilege in a highly hierarchical society, his view of morality included only men of his high social status. For Aristotle, human beings have the final cause of fulfilling our nature. And it is in our nature, Aristotle says, to reach the ultimate goal for all people, which is happiness. Well, not just happiness, really, not happy feelings, but a particular state of happiness that he calls eudaimonia. To understand eudaimonia, don't think of it as pleasures, because those are fleeting, but think of it as the contentment of living well and having a life worth living. What's interesting about what Aristotle is claiming is that everything we do is in one way or another directed toward the goal of this contented well-being. Ask why you are doing anything you do. But you're listening to this right now. Why? Well, you're wanting to learn something about business ethics. Well, why? Well, to get a good grade in a course. Well, why? To get a university degree. Why? Well, to get a good job. Why? Well, to make some money. Why? To have a good life. Yes. Eudaimonia is the ultimate goal of all human beings. Now, yes, some people chase wealth, fame, honor, or other fleeting feel-good ways. But eudaimonia, what should also be called the good life, comes from living a disciplined life of virtue. Aristotle taught that the good life is the life of virtue, and virtue is measured by what helps people to achieve the good life. In other words, you achieve a good life by moving toward constantly living a good life. Now, this isn't circular reasoning, it is the nature of virtue ethics. For Aristotle, we must develop our mind and psyche to cultivate the virtues of temperance, justice, and courage that define a good person. We cultivate virtue by practicing virtue. We become just by doing just acts. We become temperate by doing temperate acts, and so on. In living our lives this way, we fulfill our human purpose and will eventually achieve the state of eudaimonia. Being virtuous brings us the good life. 
So this is the broad purpose of life, but what about specific ethical decisions? When faced with a decision to do A or B, how do we know which choice is the ethical course of action? Not surprisingly, Aristotle says that the person of virtue will be able to decide on the correct choice by exercising virtue. This is because, Aristotle says, virtue is a state of character concerned with a choice, lying on the mean relative to us, this being determined by a rational principle and by that principle by which the man of practical wisdom would determine it. And this sentence is the heart of Aristotle's ethics, and it holds a lot of meaning. Let's expand on each component. First, virtue is a state of character. This is the application of practicing virtue previously mentioned. We become just by doing just acts. Being truly virtuous means wanting to make the correct ethical decisions. It is not enough to know what is virtuous. One must live it and act on it. Aristotle says that a virtuous person delights in virtuous actions and is vexed at vicious ones. So the virtuous person makes a choice to act but the choice must come from a certain type of character. The virtuous person makes the virtuous choice by determining the mean course of action relative to the situation. Uh, by mean, Aristotle refers to the course of action that lies between extremes. He explains that excess is a form of failure, and so is defect, while the intermediate is praised and a form of success. Aristotle's position is that the middle path is always the correct path. Oh, here's an example from Aristotle's time. Let's say your infantry unit is in a battle and the enemy is charging your position. One extreme reaction to this would be to run away in panic. The opposite extreme would be to abandon your defensive position and charge the enemy. Between these extremes of cowardice and foolhardiness is the mean of standing your ground, and meeting the enemy's charge. This simple example is emblematic of how Aristotle wants us to think about every moral decision that confronts us. Thinking is the key because the mean is determined by reason. The mean is relative to us, to the particular situation that confronts us. That relativity does not imply that we have any leeway to make personal moral choices. Aristotle specifies that the mean relative to us is being determined by a rational principle that any and every man of practical wisdom would determine. What Aristotle is indicating here is that though every situation is different, every situation has one rationally correct moral answer to it. Every rational man in that situation would reach the same conclusion. And Aristotle does mean men only. He believed women lacked the capacity for reason, a clearly extreme and irrational belief, and quite hypocritical. But back to the infantry example. If any man in that unit can keep his head and think rationally about that situation, he will be able to determine the correct prudent action to take. The bottom line for Aristotle's ethics is the demand that we always practice rationally driven moderation. Aristotle's word for this is phronesis, which is best translated as practical wisdom with a strong sense of prudence. We do not make moral decisions based on emotion or personal preferences. We make moral decisions based on the middle path as determined by rational principles. If we live life in this way, we will develop virtue. And living the virtuous life is the efficient cause of us reaching our final cause of eudaimonia. It is important to remember that living the virtuous life is a process. It is not an action we do once and there we are. Acquiring virtue for Aristotle meant developing the habit of phronesis. Only the person who consistently practices phronesis can develop moral virtue. Like any good habit, the more we practice it, the easier it becomes. Acting virtuously creates a virtuous character, and a virtuous character will more readily act virtuously. Aristotle's example is developing courage. You may lack courage at first, but by performing an initial act of courage, you begin a habit. Developing courage is the process of incremental change. 
small steps of prudent courage taken over time that molds the person's character. The person of moral virtue cares not about fame, fortune, or power, but to act according to the dictates of reason, seeking neither to control others or to submit to others. He acts with wise, prudent self-control and has the contentment of living well and having a life worth living. So how does this relate to business, especially because Aristotle says nothing specifically about business? Well, within Aristotle's ethics, greed is excessive, irrational, and dishonorable. There's nothing wrong in making money in business, but in business transactions, one should always act with prudent, practical wisdom, being fair and honest, never giving in to extremes, always taking the middle, prudent path of practical wisdom, as can be rationally determined. The mean within any business transaction would be a fair exchange, neither party profiting excessively in the transaction. To be dishonest and cheat someone in business is to be unvirtuous and should bring the dishonest business person into dishonor and ridicule. In Aristotle's ethics, virtuous conduct is the measure of a person. This is in stark contrast to the corporate capitalist world of today when greed is considered good and the amount of wealth one has accumulated is the measure of a person. The idea that one should be honorable and virtuous is not entirely gone, but it has become a secondary concern to what is now considered success in business, making high profits. Another system of virtue ethics was that of the ancient Chinese philosopher Kung Fu Tzu, known in the West by the Latinized version of his name, Confucius. He didn't have anything to do with martial arts, but his name means Master Kung, because he became a revered teacher in Chinese society and still has a strong influence in China. Master Kung developed an elaborate ethical system of practices based on virtue. Above all, Master Kung's system called for harmony and order. Central to this call for order was the abstract idea of Li, an ancient Chinese concept meaning ritual, proper conduct, or propriety. Li is a set concrete guide to human action. It originally was a system of ritual practice within the imperial court and Master Kung saw the imperial court as the microcosm of the world. The reason for this is that strongly implied with the concept of Li is that performing it brings gain and benefit to the system in which it is performed. Correctly practicing the rites and protocol within the imperial court will bring harmony and order to the court. Similarly, Master Kung taught there are rites and protocol of every aspect of human life that should be correctly practiced and that doing so will bring harmony and order to the world. Master Kung saw his ethical system as a mean between the one extreme of tyrannical brute force to maintain order and the opposite extreme of relying on individuals to practice mutual love and aid to bring about harmony. This was in the spirit of Aristotle, though Kung predated Aristotle. Also similar to Aristotle, Master Kung emphasized self-control in all things, never acting too rashly or too timidly. Balance was key. Maintain a constant mean of prudent action between extremes in order to act properly. Too much hostility or too much love toward others are extremes to be avoided. Act instead according to the rules of Li or proper conduct. If you are in a situation in which the rules of proper conduct are not clear, then you should weigh the circumstances, the Chinese concept of quan, and act with a sense of rightness. Proper conduct was everything for Master Kung, because this was the only way to attain the good. He thought that humans were, by nature, desiring the good, but are easily corrupted and therefore need to be thoroughly educated in virtue. A significant aspect of Li was training people in the way of virtue. Because Li brings gain to the system in which it is practiced, all people and the society in which they live 
benefit from learning and the practice of what they learn. The education he proposed was strict and not tolerant of failure. He wrote that we should advance the good and set aside the corrupt because rotten wood cannot be carved. Education carves a person into a virtuous, productive human. And you can guess what he thought we should do with rotten wood. Central to proper conduct was observing the proper relations between people. Master Kung believed that harmony and order required hierarchical relations. The emperor ruled over his subjects, a master rules over his apprentices, and a father rules over his family. Respect for one's superiors and elders was perhaps the most important ritual to observe in Li. Master Kung saw the family as the basic unit of society, and the structure of the family was rigidly hierarchical. Disobeying one's parents is unthinkable, and honoring one's parents is essential to social order. Everyone in the family should be deferential to their elders, respecting, serving, and obeying them. That hierarchy maintains harmony and order in the family, just as it does in the imperial court. That hierarchy, implemented in every aspect of social life, is what will maintain harmony in society. Therefore, Master Kung requires that society teach every member the correct procedures to show respect, servitude, and obedience to one's superiors. It's easy to see how Master Kung's ethical philosophy applies in a business setting. Li, in business, is proper conduct, following the rules, following the protocols, what we now call in business ease, policies and procedures. A business's policies and procedures should be determined through a prudent and rational means of, of decision-making based on tradition, and employees should be thoroughly trained in following procedures and, indeed, the following of following procedures, knowing how to follow procedures. Employees should be cultivated in this practice. The family in business is the business itself and one must have respect and be willing to serve and obey one's superiors within the business. Disobedience to the company or one's superiors is just as unthinkable as disobeying one's parents or one's emperor. To be fair, Master Kung also thought that the ethics of Li included the rules that supervisors, business owners, parents, and emperor have an obligation to take care of the people who are under them. No one is above the rules of virtue. And in fact, Master Kung taught that if the emperor ever violates the rules of Li, ever acts in a dishonorable and non-virtuous manner, his kingdom will topple, that the heavens themselves will bring down his kingdom and end his rule and bring in someone who will follow the rules of Lee. And so ideally in business, the owners of a business and every supervisor within a business who has any authority at all should also follow the rules of proper conduct, should also be persons of virtue, and care for, not abuse, their subordinates. In summary, what ancient virtue ethics says for us for business practices today is that the bottom line of only looking at consequences, only looking at short-term gain or even long-term gain, is not a proper way to run a business. Behaving prudently, not taking excessive risks, but not being excessively timid in business dealings, always looking for fairness, always remembering that business transactions should benefit all parties involved, not just one party, are at the heart of ancient virtue ethics for business. If a company were today to apply ancient virtue ethics to their company, they would need to cultivate a culture of virtue within the company, educate people within the idea of attaining excellence within all of their business dealings and all of their practices. And of course, the company would have to act virtuously, never abusing their employees, never trying to be dishonest to their customers. 
Some would say such practices are not practical in today's business world, and maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but it's something to consider. Thank you for listening to the Insert Philosophy Here podcast. Please subscribe and go to insertphilosophyhere.com to see my other offerings. You can support the Insert Philosophy Here project with a donation at ko-fi.com. Thank you for listening and see you next time.